All right, well, today I just want to start out with talking. Um, it's what I do best. So Friday I had a real nice long phone call with a, a very dear friend of many years. And, uh, you know, I have those now and then. I always enjoy them. Um, sometimes my long phone calls end up being counseling sessions. Sometimes it's just friends talking. Sometimes it's both. This was one of those. My friend asked a question. The question was, do you ever get angry at God because of your pain? You see, my friend has chronic pain issues. Well, so do I. Um, mine started in 2005. And uh, that was due to an injury, a uh, bone injury. I took another one in 2009. And then in 2012, getting much worse in 2013, I added some more chronic pain. <laughs> that was a disease. Now I've been asked that before, do I ever get angry at God over the pain? can't look at my notes, this isn't in there. Um, the answer is no. Now, that was not always the answer. You know, even before 2005, before my chronic pain started, I'd been through rough times. I'd been through painful times. I've talked about it before, and I'll talk about it again, but in 1997 was the worst emotional pain I've ever felt in my life. I got very angry at God. That's the last time I got angry at God. It took me six months to get over it. It took a lot of hard work. But it built in me an understanding that has carried me ever since. Up until then, I think a lot of my anger towards God came and went. I don't know that I was ever real angry at him, but frustrated maybe. In 97, I was angry, okay? I understand that. I think the reason I'm talking is because I think some people aren't going to believe that I understand what what they're going through. I understand that. You know, until you've been in chronic pain, and I'm not just talking about physical, I'm talking about emotional. Until you've been in chronic pain, it's hard to imagine or understand. Even doctors, oh, they think they know everything, but they say some of the stupidest things to someone that's in chronic pain. I guess they think they're doing good, but I mean, sometimes I just want to put them in some chronic pain. Know what I mean? <clears throat> then, after we talked about that for a little while, we came in a, the natural follow-up question that I hear all also. I'm asked, how do you deal so well with pain? It just takes away my desire to do anything at all. Well, and I understand that question, too. Um, unlike the anger issue, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to admit here that I still struggle with this one. Sometimes I hurt so bad I just can't do anything. Sometimes it's only for a few hours and I can push myself through it. 
Sometimes it takes a few days. In 2014, it took me a few weeks or months, I think. You know, not to get through all of it, but just to, you know, to really get to where I was enjoying anything. <clears throat> Sometimes I can camouflage it, but only from people that don't know me well. This person I was talking to knows me well. I never camouflage it. That conversation led into a spiritual conversation. And that's where I'm headed, but I'm not going to go there yet. Well, one of the things I said was, you know, Paul had his thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. Everyone likes to think their problem is the same as Paul's thorn in the flesh. For me, that would be chronic pain. Yeah, maybe so. Well, if Paul had a thorn, then I got a lot of thorns. <laughs> um, don't know if I deal as well with mine as he did with his, but yeah, I do the best I can, you know what I mean? That was Friday. Little, little did I realize that the next day on Saturday, this, this week just passed, was the annual Denver Motorcycle Show and Swap Meet. And my daughter was going to drive me down there. Um, you know, I've said it, I think I've said it here on YouTube, but my family doesn't like me dri driving late at night. Um, truth is, by the end of a day, I'm really not fit to drive. Um, it's not the narcotics I can take. I don't always, I don't like them. But it's that fighting the pain wears me out. And I become physically too tired to be safe to drive. And so they like to have somebody else to drive when I do long days. And Saturday I was going to Denver, go through the show, and drive home. My daughter drove. <laughs> and she went to load up my power chair, and it didn't work. Now, it's given us problems before. We got it for $50. The guy said it worked. I think there was a reason why he had another one for sale for $150. His wife had passed away. He had two chairs. I bought the cheap one, bought two new batteries for it, and it seems to have some kind of short, and we can't figure it out. Well, Saturday morning, it decided not to work no matter what we did. Previous fixes no longer fixed. So now the question becomes what do I do? You know, in previous years, I go to the swap meet. It's one of the biggest events of my life every year. And I go to the swap meet and I would, uh, I would go down the day early, maybe two days early. And I'd talk to the vendors while they were setting up, and I'd go to one of the motorcycle club's uh, parties Friday night. And then all day Saturday, I'd wander around talking to people, and I'd go to one of the club's parties Saturday night. And on Sunday, I'd go, and I'd talk to people, and then I'd come home. Well, the last couple of years, uh, wasn't working very good, and this year, there's no way. I was gonna use the power chair, but it's not working, what do I do? Well, it'd be real easy to say, just stay home. My legs were already hurting, um, and the weather uh, made them worse, I guess, I don't know. I could have driven down and borrowed my sister's power chair. She'd let me use it, she's offered before. But that had added an hour plus to our day, and it was already going to be long enough. So I decided to be a man and tough it out. And I took my cane, and I just decided to walk. I decided before I got there that I was going to take a lot of breaks, but I was going to walk. It was a great day. A great day. 
I talk to a lot of folk and and you know I I get to places where the people knew me and I'd sit down in their booth sometimes and they'd let me and uh, mostly they don't like anybody coming into their booth but they cut me some slack uh, most uh, be amazed how many people there know me from my years of doing this and being me I gregarious as all get out I talk to everybody so I talk to a lot of people I talk to a pastor who uh, well, some some stuff happened and he and his wife became very angry at God and church and Christians and for a couple of years they stopped going to church anywhere but this past year he turned his life back over to God and he wanted to tell me all about why he did it and why he turned back to God and how he's been doing and what he's been doing and where he's been doing it and uh, he said he thinks he's ready to start getting back into preaching he wanted me to pray with him he was excited to see me there. He was in a, a booth with one of the Christian groups and I had never seen him with that group before. And yeah, it was, he had been affiliated with them back in the 90s, but only briefly. But uh, they were helping him through all this, but he'd been looking for me. Uh, back in 2007, he actually preached at our church one, one time. I'd visited his a couple of times. So that was fun. At lunch, um, I spent about, I don't know, 20 minutes with a fellow pastor who is struggling with discouragement. My word, not his. Feeling ineffective. I can relate to that one. You know, my ministry is a little unconventional. There's no handbook out there that tells me how to do what I do. No seminary teaches this. And he's doing a lot of similar stuff, different but similar. And he wanted my advice. So we had a nice conversation. I don't often get to counsel two pastors in one day at a, at a secular motorcycle rally. When I say secular, I mean, you know, we had the, all the clubs that the cops are after. You know, you walk around and you see cops in uniform everywhere. And if you know what to look for, there's cops not in uniform everywhere too. Just as many or maybe more. <laughs> But with uh, 20,000 people there, you know, uh, probably 12,000 on Saturday, maybe 13, uh, I'd expect a few cops. I don't know what they'd do, though. They'd need an army if there's a riot. Okay, so I've got stories. I, I've got other stories. I can boast about how I deal with pain. I've got a proven track record. Uh, many people know about my issues, and, uh, you know, it's the way it is because I, I don't try and hide much out of my life. But I'm not telling you all this to tell you how I overcome pain. You know, that's, that's nice. Most athletes, most soldiers, they can tell you how to overcome pain, okay? Sure, I'd do it, but I want you to understand and get in that mindset right now. Um, I don't care if you're an athlete or not. I don't care if you're in a wheelchair, on crutches, on a walker. I don't care if you, nobody else can see your pain. If your pain is one that's invisible, it's still there. I'm talking to you. But be careful now. Because if you're sitting here listening saying, well, I don't have any chronic pains, get set. Because now is when I get to you. All of this has been introduction. And I'm almost done with the introduction. When I was a young man, and this is the last story in the introduction, 
when I was a young man, I learned to enjoy fighting. I did. <clears throat> as a as a man of 19, 20 years of age, I was six foot tall. I weighed 285 pounds. I could bench press. My best personal best was 585 pounds. And weighing 285 pounds at that point, um, I was sizable. I had size. I had strength. I learned that I was stronger than most, and I outweighed most. <laughs> Today I outweigh almost everybody, but I ain't got no strength left. But I learned to enjoy fighting because I learned to enjoy winning. I also learned that other people feared pain a whole lot more than I did. In fact, I almost enjoyed the pain. I would pick a fight, usually with three or four guys or maybe more. One or two was boring. Those were too easy. There were a few times where one or two guys gave me a run for my money, but I liked three or four guys at a time. Now I knew I was gonna get hurt, but that's all right. And I'd try and you know, use this motor mouth of mine and I'd get one of them to smash me in the face. i keep my hands down on my side, and they'd, they'd, they'd take enough and they'd split my lip or break my nose or black my eye, and I'd just throw my head back and laugh. Kind of freak some people out. <laughs> oh, I enjoyed that. Because you know what I learned? Is if you're gonna fight, you're gonna feel pain. I wanted to get that over and done with. Feel a little pain. Most people can't do that much damage with one blow. Give me some pain. Then I'm really ready to fight. That was my approach to physical confrontation. Um, Years later, when I wasn't, after I became a Christian, there were a couple times, uh, I won't tell the stories, but where young men got angry at me and took a, a wild shot, totally out of the blue. Caught me pretty good, both of them. And I didn't even blink. That hurt. But I didn't even blink. I just looked at him and said, are you done or do we need to go at this? <laughs> they... They thought they, they were going to win with one shot. And I'm just standing there wondering. They didn't want to continue. <clears throat> but now, I want to take this to a spiritual level. Are you ahead of me yet? Spiritual pain. What spiritual pain? Christians, all too often, in my opinion, seem afraid of pain. And I'm not talking about physical pain. I've already made that clear. Now, what's spiritual pain? How do I go at this? When, when we're talking about God's work, I hear excuses all the time. I mean, all kinds of reasons why somebody can't do something in ministry or whatever. I'm tired of after working all day at my job. I need to spend more time with my family. Usually that's uh, double talk for I want to watch TV tonight. <laughs> hey, we're Americans. Come on. Or how about I can't afford the expense. It's going to cost you a little bit. 
it wouldn't cost so much if you didn't have big car payments and motorcycle payments and boat payments and snowmobile payments and vacation payments and expensive furniture payments. Um, I don't know how. I'm not a people type person. And the list goes on. Listen, I'm not going to talk to you about all of those excuses, reasons, justifications, or whatever you want to call them. We can sit down and do that. If you want to bring them out one by one, you call me up, you email me, you stop me and talk to me, and we'll go over them one by one. But listen first to what I got to say. The first thing I'm going to tell you is, let's check your priorities. Now, I'm talking here to Christians, right? So, I should be able to quote the Bible, right? That should be a standard we can follow and live by and agree on, right? Jesus said, I'm talking about priorities now, or excuses, whichever word you want. Jesus said in Luke 14, 26, that we have to hate our father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, or we cannot be his disciple. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said we can't serve two masters. And he specifically says God and money. In Luke 9, 62, Jesus said, No one who starts to serve and turns back is fit for service. Listen, God does not take second place. Somebody else or something else is more important than him and taking time away from him. You have a problem. God does not take second place. You don't have the finances to serve God. You have a problem. If he wants you to do something, he'll provide the finances to do it. The only problem is most Americans have already squandered it on all this stuff that we do, credit cards and bank financing and so forth and so on. If we don't waste our money on selfish things, we'll have the money to serve Him. Oh, but Pastor Velcro, I've earned the right to take a nice vacation. Good, good, go ahead. Did you know for less than $2,000, you can take a whole week or even two weeks and go to Mexico and help build a new school? For $7,000, you can go to India and spend two weeks going all over the countryside in four-wheel drive vehicles with great big tires. You're going to get stuck in the mud and you're going to see sights that most white men ain't never seen. Most people of other color skin ain't seen. Ain't been too many people there. For less than $10,000, you can go to Africa and spend two weeks there, and for a few dollars more, you can go on that precious safari too. But in the meanwhile, you can go to village after village and share God's word and help them drill a well, build a building, help treat them medically. Don't tell me you ain't got the money. If you're making minimum wage, I'll help you find something you can do for God within your budget. God does not take second place. You say you want to be a Christian. You said that one time. I want to be a Christian. I want to serve God. And you still say it? Don't put God in second place. You got all these excuses. You're, you're a hypocrite. You're a liar, 
the truth is not in you if God is in second place. You're afraid of losing friends? Well, I don't want to be seen as a religious fanatic. Why not? I love it. And if you do it right, without offending everybody you see, they still like you. God does not second, take second place, people. Something, someone, anyone, anything, what's preventing you from serving God and putting Him in first place? You have a problem. <clears throat> All right. Have I got you motivated? Are you ready to pay the price? A little pain might help you get ready. Sure enough, come see me. I'll help you feel some spiritual pain. You know what athletes and soldiers say? No pain, no gain. They plan on paying the price of some pain in training so that they can achieve. Okay, sermon done, right? No, I may have gone long enough, but buckle your seatbelt and hang on because we're about to go into overdrive. Okay, these are going to come out. I'm going to jackhammer these right down your throat. Just open up and swallow wide. Philippians 3.8. Paul tells us, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may attain Christ. Wow. Man, I could just read the whole book of Philippians right here. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not Christ, I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live by faith in the, in the life I live in flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I've been crucified with Christ. Oh, but... I don't want to. I don't want to suffer. Get over it. My modern American Christian, most of you don't even understand what it means to be a Christian. Paul said, "I have been crucified." Romans chapter six. He says, "Don't you know that when you've been buried in baptism, you've been buried into His death, and you rise up to walk in a new life?" Romans. 116, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of grace. Oh, goodness. Who is Jesus talking to in Mark 8, 36? He said, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his own soul? Who is he talking to? If you read it in context, see, we use that all the time to tell somebody you need to be a Christian for what does it value you if you save your your worldly goods but you forfeit your soul you need to get your soul right with God so you can now people he was talking to those who wanted to be his disciples go back and read Mark 8 let's read that verse again Mark 8 36 what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul Christians, he's talking to you. Don't think you've got your soul all wrapped up. Paul told the Philippians to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I don't think saying, dear Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me my sins, amen, is fear and trembling. Maybe it is for a little bit, but it don't include a bunch of workout. Workouts include pain, people. Pain. Isn't he saying the same thing he said to the rich young ruler? He said, go sell everything you got, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. He told me, that story's told in, in Matthew 19, Mark 10, and, and in Luke, um, 
16, no, 18. It's told in three Gospels. You think the Holy Spirit wanted us to hear that? Go sell what you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. Now we like to think that Jesus wasn't talking to us. It was a different culture back then, really. They didn't need to have money to live. They didn't have to have a place to stay. They didn't have to have food to eat. They didn't have to take vacations. They didn't have to take care of family. You know, in Acts 5, a couple of the apostles were taken before the Sanhedrin, and they considered it, they considered it uh, of great worth that they were allowed to suffer for the name of Jesus. In Acts 9, Saul is blind, and Ananias is told to go and lay hands on him, and the Holy Spirit tells Ananias, Paul's going to, Saul then, is going to learn how much he must suffer. That's after he became a believer, people. You want to be like Paul? <laughs> You know, not too many of us say that, because he suffered. James 1, 2 says that we should rejoice when we face trials. And yet most Christians today, they just pray to, oh God, deliver me from the evil. Don't let the, the God, I got a little pain in my body. Please heal me of my pain. I don't want my pain. Sure, I pray for healing. I don't care if I get it or not. I'm going to keep on serving him. Do you hear what I am saying? Revelation 2.10, the Holy Spirit is speaking to the people at Smyrna. It says, I see your poverty. I know you suffer. But he says, don't be afraid that you're going to suffer, even if you have to die. Now we know he's not talking to us. No, no, not us. We're American Christians. We don't face that kind of persecution. This is where most pastors say, but I pray we should. I don't care if we do or not. I don't care if we do or not. If we're persecuted, I'm going to speak up for the name of Christ. If we're not persecuted, I'm going to speak up for the name of Christ. How about you? Revelation 21.4. You know what that chapter is? It's the next last chapter in the Bible. The last two chapters in the Bible are about a new heaven and a new earth. Right at the beginning of that, John writes that God will wipe away all our tears in Revelation 21, verse 4. God will wipe all our tears away. And the old things are passed away, and that includes, in the, right there in 21, 4, he says, includes death. Now, he doesn't say he's going to wipe away our tears if we suffered. He says, God will wipe away our tears. If you ain't suffering, you probably ain't got no tears. You hear what I'm saying? No soldier goes into battle wanting pain. No soldier goes into battle not expecting he might face pain. That soldier is prepared to suffer pain. You know who doesn't suffer pain? Spectators. Are you a spectator or are you a soldier for Christ?